Hello everybody and welcome, my name is Ursa Ryan and today I'm going to be taking you through the three most recent leaders from the fifth instalment of the Leaders Pass and for each one I'm going to give you my best three tips for maximising your gameplay with each leader, starting with Theodora. Tip number one with Theodora is that you should be rushing holy sites as soon as you can for a few reasons. Theodora leads Byzantium who receive an extra great profit point from cities with a holy site district, so effectively putting a holy site down gives you two profit points per turn instead of one. It means you've got a lot more profit point for your money and you should slap these down really quickly because you can very quickly take the commanding seat when it comes to getting an early religion. If you start a game in the ancient era you'll need the 60 profit points to get a religion and trust me getting two per holy site that makes it a lot easier than getting one. The other more important reason you should be rushing holy sites is that the culture you get is as important as the profit points. Theodora picks up culture equal to the adjacency bonus of holy sites and that's really really big early game. So really before you do anything with Theodora you go into your tech tree and you press astrology. Find that natural wonder as fast as you can, get this tech unlocked as quickly as you can and get get building the holy site as fast as you can. Conveniently for me, I found Signy almost immediately, which means astrology comes as boosted. But you'll notice that I receive 1.2 culture per turn. If I were to take a monument start, that would go to 3.2 culture. A big difference. Monuments are worth 2 culture per turn. That effectively triples how much I get. However, even a holy site with a plus 2 adjacency, for instance if I were to plop it on this tile, building that holy site gives me 2 culture per turn as long as it has the faith adjacency of plus 2 per turn. It's a huge thing. And more importantly, that culture can become boosted as well, not only by improving the tiles around the holy site, but also by civics that you unlock later. Under no circumstances should you be taking the monument first. Go for your holy site. If you don't have a natural wonder that's around you like I did, focus on getting scouts out quickly, and once you've explored a little bit around your land, make sure you have a builder to hand. And this leads me to my second tip with Theodora, how to plan out your holy sites. Now there are a number of things that increase the adjacency bonuses of holy sites that you can get, they're listed all in the Civilopedia for you, but they boil down into three categories. Your major adjacencies, such as plus two faith from natural wonder tiles adjacent to your holy site, your standard adjacencies where you get one faith per tile. These are mountains, government plazas, and in Theodora's case, farms. And finally you have minor adjacencies, which is where you need two tiles to take one faith. Classically, other districts and woods are things that do that. For instance, I have a good example here of two wood tiles next to each other. If I were to put my holy site down on that tile, I'd have a plus one adjacency because I have the two woods. If I were to put my holy site next to this mountain, you'd see I'd get plus one because of the standard adjacency of one mountain, and on this tile, I'd get plus two because I'd have two mountains. When you plan out holy sites with Theodora, you should be ignoring all minor adjacencies. Do not look at where your districts and where woods are. Focus entirely on major adjacencies and standard adjacencies. And the reason for this is that you can get plus six adjacency on any holy site you put down in your nation as long as you go for standard adjacencies. And plus six, that's really big. Do you remember I said the monument would give you two culture per turn? How about six culture per turn? For instance, I'm looking at my start, it may be tempting to plonk my holy site on this tile there. Not only does the Singi give me two major adjacency, but I've also got the possibility of putting farms down around the holy site, increasing it to plus five. Looks pretty good, doesn't it? Well, there are a couple of issues with this. Firstly, this is a hill tile above. I can't put a farm on that tile until very late into the game when I unlock civil engineering. Secondly, I'm more likely to put down a pasture on this cattle nearby. Very tempting. I could remove the cattle, put a farm down for plus six, but it doesn't alleviate the problem of this tile above. A good Byzantium holy site should have at least six adjacency, and pretty much any holy site can be given that. In my case, it's actually worth removing this cattle and placing my holy site on top of it, because not only do I get the Singi bonus, but I now have the ability to put five farms around the holy site. 
Now my holy site is going to be worth plus seven. Plus seven. Yes, you heard me right. I'll have to make a minor diversion here to pick up animal husbandry so I can remove the cattle, but in this case, I think it's worth the wait. Again, it's very tempting to use woods in order to give you good holy sites. This would be a plus three with no work required, but if I were to remove the woods and simply replace them with farms, my adjacency actually goes up. So don't focus on them. Focus more on the eventual result. Farms you can put down without any tech and they will increase your growth of the city. They're really good. Let's press ahead a little bit so you can see my third tip. In this particular example, because I'm waiting on animal husbandry, I'm taking the time just to build a builder. It's very simple and I need it ideally to remove this cattle. No harm in doubling up on these things. I've unlocked animal husbandry. I've got my builder ready. I'm going to chop out the cattle to improve my population in my city to plus four and I'm going to immediately put the holy site down. By putting only three farms down around a holy site you can guarantee yourself an early holy site adjacency bonus era score rush which is quite effective but as you can see even with just a single holy site down I'm now earning enough culture to whiz through the early game civic tree. I'll be at mysticism, political philosophy, and theology in no time. Theology being a very important destination. This scripture card will go into your government as soon as you get it, and it'll never leave because already that would make this holy site worth eight faith and eight culture per turn. And as you can see, because we planned our holy site around standard adjacencies, as I put these farms down, the holy site just gets better and better and better and better. That is now a plus seven holy site. I can guarantee in any game you're playing with Theodora, you can get at least plus six. But plus seven is always nice, especially as I can now get the state workforce in four turns. My third and final tip with Theodora is all about which religion you pick. Now, seeing as Theodora can almost entirely guarantee that she will receive a plus six adjacency holy site, it has been said quite a few times, why not throw production into the mix of culture and faith? Why not use this and pick work ethic? And honestly, work ethic is a very strong pick. Holy site faith adjacency becomes production adjacency. Simply pick this and you'll find that your early game cities are turbocharged. My holy site is now worth seven production as well as faith and culture. That's more than doubled my early game production. Very handy indeed. Especially if you're playing multiplayer or if you're playing larger games, sometimes work ethic may not be available and there are other options as well. Here are my favorite three. The first option is a channel favorite, Feed the World. Instead of focusing on production, you make sure that every holy site in your empire effectively is giving you six food and four housing. What does that actually mean? Well, the best way of looking at food is that you lose two food for every population in your city. Right now, Constantinople is five population, so I'm losing 10 food per turn. So although I'm working 13, I'm only seeing the benefit of about three. Feed the world gives you six extra food per city. That effectively means that three of those population are three. Conveniently, every Every free population go up, you unlock another district. And in this case, instead of having three food per turn, I'd be on nine. It triples my available food. Feed the World only applies when you build shrines and temples, so it forces you to get those buildings, and that, in a sense, forces you to get more faith per turn as well. And whilst seven production per turn unworked is really useful, if I had three more population in this city, you'd see I'd be able to work through extra tiles, and with mines and lumber mills, I could easily make that production back. It's perhaps not a strategy that is highly synergized like work ethic, but I'm a huge fan of Feed the World, and I think, especially with the additional faith per turn you'll receive, you would be able to put more districts down and monopolize early game great people where you needed. For instance, 1,350 faith to get a great engineer. Well, you'll have six extra faith per turn on top of your regular holy site faith, just because you'll be forcing yourself to get shrines and temples. That will very quickly add up to an engineer. Along those lines, another good option is Jesuit education. You reliably get a lot of faith per turn, a huge amount of faith per turn, each holy site likely to be giving you plus 12 faith per turn. So why not turn that into campus and theater square district buildings? Using all your faith per turn, you can become an absolute cultural or scientific powerhouse by using your faith to put down all the buildings you would ordinarily be building. And what's better, if you had a new city that had, for instance, a campus but no production, you can use the faith from your big capital and immediately buy it in. A very powerful combo indeed. Finally, and I've been looking forward to this for some time, Theodora actually makes warrior monks a viable option. 
Now, this is probably not as optimized as any of the other choices, but it's a lot of fun. Spending your faith on warrior monks is a good use of that faith per turn. Culture bombing adjacent tiles when completing a holy site also means that you can guarantee that you will be able to work a lot of farms around a holy site as it gets made. Warrior monks also stacks really nicely with crusade. Because don't forget, you're still playing Byzantium, but Byzantium still spreads their religion whenever you get into combat. Look at that. Finishing the holy site has culture bombed all the tiles around it, which means I can now very easily start putting down my farms to get even more culture and even more faith per turn. Oh, every time you unlock the scripture card, it's always so much fun. Look at these yields. 14 faith per turn, 14 culture beautiful to see. The best bit about this strategy is because you're Byzantium and because you've focused on getting standard adjacencies in your holy sites, you have a lot of faith per turn. So once you pop out a temple, you can get these warrior monks rather cheaply. And especially early game, 40 melee strength and 3 movement, that's no pushover. Now getting the timings to work exactly can be a little bit tricky. Warrior monks after all are only as powerful as swordsmen so on higher difficulties the rush can be tricky. Let's say you have a weak neighbour near you. These warrior monks can make quite the impact. That's a 52 strength attack with a bit of flanking and with a bit of oligarchy and more importantly it spreads my religion around whilst I'm at it. So this warrior monk is now attacking Breslav with 60 strength. Now I don't want to say that this strategy is more successful and more effective than work ethic, I don't think it is, but this may be the first genuine build we've seen that works on warrior monks and I need to explore this a little bit more. Next up is Germany's new leader, Ludwig. Now Ludwig was one of the most entertaining leaders brought in in the leader's pass full stop because the Swan King ability where you get culture from incomplete wonders and tourism from all culture adjacencies, that changes very much how you think about the game and it's a lot of fun. I really, really, really enjoyed it. And so my first tip with Ludwig is a fairly obvious one. If you've unlocked a wonder and you can put it next to a district, it should be going down. Any wonder not placed on the map is a wonder you're missing out on culture from. So for instance, this is a little snapshot of the Ludwig game we played on the channel before. It's turn 98 and I've unlocked a whole range of ancient and classical era wonders. Now, unfortunately, the AI has been building quite a few of those. So you can see over here, Colosseum, Pyramids, Apadana. I'm not alone in this, the AI is ruining my fun. But it hasn't stopped me from placing as many wonders as I can. Hanging Gardens is complete and that's giving me full culture because it's next to two districts but even just placing I believe this is great library now I've got no intention of building that at all that is a total useless wonder for me but it's still giving me two culture per turn so it goes down same over here that's Stonehenge I'm not getting a religion with Stonehenge that's a silly idea I have Exodus of the Evangelists up I'm gonna be earning my great chair profit myself but still it goes down Petra I've put one turn of production into Petra and it's giving me eight culture because four districts are around it. People forget this applies to districts that are not specialist districts. City centers, aqueducts, it all counts. Get it down. And in order to get the most out of this, you need to remember A, your districts need to be completed and B, you need district variety. I am as bad as anybody at focusing on certain districts when I play certain strategies. So obviously hands are really good. I haven't put an encampment down. I haven't put a harbor down. And because of that, Colossus, Great Lighthouse, Terracotta Army. All of these wonders are available, but unavailable to be put down. I can't, I haven't got anywhere I can pop them. So after the building this workshop, it might be a good idea for me to contemplate, for instance, building an encampment and then putting Statue of Zeus near it, or Terracotta Army or something, or maybe even going down to Munich, popping a harbor down and then putting some wonders down either side of it. Again, that would already, just by finishing the harbor district there, if I were to then even just put a turn's worth of production down on Great Lighthouse and Colossus, that would be worth four culture per turn for me in total even more if I then put a district down on this tile anyone you can put down that you haven't put down is losing you out on culture it's three culture per turn you might as well use it I haven't got a single theater square down and I'm still managing to keep up with the AI on deity very handy I've loaded slightly later into the game turn 135 now and I wanted to do this because I wanted to talk about my second point districts now Swan King was such an exciting ability that changed up how Ludwig played that people got really obsessed with the culture that Wonders gave. It's worth 
remembering, you're still playing as Germany, and Germany is all about district play. Each one of your cities can produce one more district than usual, and you have the Hansa, one of the best industrial zones, or actually the best district in the game, quite potentially. It's cheap, it's productive, and the adjacencies you can get on Hansas are quite frankly silly. This is just a casual plus nine. When you play Ludwig, you want to make sure that the first thing you build in any city is the Hansa. And there's a couple of reasons for this. Firstly, just building it will give you more production. So this city of Stoke I stole from Eleanor and it doesn't really have much in it, but this is already a plus two Hansa. It didn't take long to build and it got adjacency just from having Mercury and Maze alongside it. So already that's helping me to build other things. Let's me put a workshop on it and it lets me use my city states to then build my commercial hub, which in turn will make my Hansa even better. More importantly, however, getting all of my Hansas down and all my workshops mean that you can monopolize great engineers. In my game, I picked up all four medieval engineers and that catapulted me. Imhotep and Asiador, between the two of them, can produce, I'd say, between four to six wonders. And wonders give you culture. There's a reason I have 119 per turn. I used both both of them to rush Mahabodhi Temple, Great Library, Mausoleum, Petra, a lot of culture was introduced into my game. It also means that later on you can set up your game for a Leonardo da Vinci run. Now Leonardo da Vinci gives you three culture per workshop. You will have workshops in all of your cities. If you have the mausoleum, that is then worth six culture per workshop. That ability alone can give Ludwig upwards of 60 to 100 culture if you play a 10 to 15 city game, which I tend to. Eventually you also get to humanism. Now this gives you the invention card, which gives you four engineer points per turn as well as two engineer points for every workshop. There's a reason why I'm monopolizing engineer points this game. Get those Hansas down. I would say the Hansas are more important to focus on than the Wonders. The Wonders should be considered to be gravy. The Hansas are the meat of your playthrough. And finally, don't forget about your other districts. This wonder here, which is just a one turn of Ruhr Valley, is giving me six culture per turn because I put wonders around it. There's a reason why this Petra is now worth plus 10. I've specifically been building around them. It means that I'm monopolizing merchant points. I'm monopolizing scientist points. I'm monopolizing engineer points. Germany gets all of the great people. You'll get more culture for doing it. You'll have a happier, more productive empire, and you'll be rich to boot. Don't forget the districts. With Ludwig, it is better that you receive some culture from putting one turn down onto as many wonders as you can, than it is actually focusing on finishing the wonders. I finished so many wonders because my production's really good and because I monopolized all of the previous engineers. But I didn't need to finish them. The wonders were almost kind of irrelevant to my strategy. The Hansas are what made it. And finally, my last point. We have to talk about tourism, not Bruno tourism. I saw a lot of people get very, very excited when Ludwig was uh, first announced, and people got really excited because tourism being produced after you hit castles, a tech in the medieval era, any culture adjacency on the map, so in this case all of the tourism, uh, the culture that I'm getting from Wonders, but you know, do remember it also applies to theatre square culture. All of that becomes tourism once you hit castles. This tourism from castles will not win you the game. A lot of people thought it would. People we're talking about sub 100 runs and crazy runs where Ludwig could use this ability to absolutely cheese the culture game. I'm telling you now, it's not enough. If you want to win a cultural victory as Ludwig, you need to do more than put wonders down. You need to build and finish wonders and you need to get as many theater squares down into your empire. You need to do everything you can to be putting walls up in your empire. You need to be doing all the usual things, rushing national, uh, natural history. You need to rush conservation. You need to consider building things like Golden Gate Bridge and Biosphere, rushing computers and environmentalism. Treat the tourism that you get from castles as a bonus amount of tourism. It will not win you the game. In all of the fast Ludwig runs I've seen so far, they have still all relied on all of the usual cheesy culture strategies from before, and mainly that involves using reliquaries, the beautiful religion that triples all of your relic tourism, and using things like that. Heroes and Legends modes, it, it's all really good tactic, but it won't be Swan King. This tourism will not win you the game. It helps, don't get me wrong, it adds a little bit extra, but don't rely on it. If you want a tourism victory, you almost want to be ignoring this aspect, focus on the culture generation, and make sure you have a backup plan. 
last but not least, it's Sejong of Korea. So Sejong might have slipped underneath the radar just a little bit in terms of excitement, but is still a very powerful leader, and you're still playing Korea, which is one of the more powerful civs in the game for being so reliably scientific. However, that can kind of be their downfall in some ways. So, the first piece of advice that I have for you is to not get obsessed with great scientists. Now, there have been many pieces of DLC, many patches, many updates, but the AI on Civ 6, it still massively focuses on great scientists, for whatever reason, the AI always will be line science and campuses and will generally try to make a play for any great scientist in the game. It's very often, especially on the higher difficulties, that you might be looking at a situation where every single classical era scientist has already been competed for or taken before you've even put your first campus up. Because of that, sometimes it can be really tempting to run campus research grants, these little projects that produce great scientist points when finished, or maybe even taking a pantheon that gives you more great scientist points every turn. Divine Spark, I think it's called. Maybe even investing your gold and faith into purchasing some of those scientists out. After all, it's incredibly tempting. Your focus, however, should be on getting your Seowon districts out and built and getting lots of cities quickly that all have these unique districts. Each one is worth four science per turn, and that four science per turn massively dwarfs any benefit of any classical era scientist. All of that time, for instance, you put into taking three Eurekas from classical or medieval tech, well, that could have gone towards making a settler, which then could have made a city and produced another district. Same with the golden faith to purchase both scientists or other scientific infrastructure. You might as well put them into builders and settlers in order to then spread your empire around. Korea weirdly works by being as wide as possible, just by having this district down. That's four science per turn. That's a huge difference, and even better, slightly later into the game when you pick up recorded history, suddenly now you have twice the adjacency bonus, all of those districts are worth 8 science per turn. The only scientist out of the 4 classical era scientists you want to go for is Hapatia. Now she is different to the others, all of the other 3 provide you with Eurekas for either technologies or civics. Zhang Heng is slightly different because he also gives you a tech if you've already got the Eureka. But Hapatia however, she builds a library instantly in the the district. Now, a library is actually quite a lot of production. To be precise, about 90. Early game, that's a lot of production. In fact, early game, you can normally run between, depending on how far into the tech tree you are, between about two to four of your great campus project, your campus research grants. They scale with tech and civic depending on how through into the game. So right now, I'm on turn 152 and it's worth 186 production. Early game, those projects will be between about 30 and 50. Even better, once you've picked her up, she will provide a free library in a city, normally in a low production city that you've just founded and put your say one in, and every library in your empire is then worth another science per turn. That means libraries are worth three science per turn, and it means that a library in a say one is now worth seven science per turn. She is the only scientist that I believe it's probably worth rushing. Now, the other three scientists are still good. They're still really good. Eurekas and civics, anything that you can boost is always going to help you. And yes, Korea gets a lot of science, but it doesn't stop a boost to like the medieval era techs, for instance, getting the education boost or, or castles and machinery. It still all works really, really well, but they're not game changing. Ultimately, the thing to remember, is, for instance, let's take a tech like shipbuilding. Now that's 160 science, which means the Eureka for that is worth 64 science. Later into the game, well, I'm already earning 133 science per turn, so if I were to miss, you know, some techs from the top, like shipbuilding or engineering down at the bottom, I can come back and pick those up really quickly later in the game, unless you have a tactic where you really need to beeline something. They're useful for gaining a bit of speed, but they're not entirely needed. The only reason that sometimes they can be really handy is if you are stuck in a normal age and you've gone for the pick that gives you a era score every time you get a Eureka, now that could be useful. But the benefits of Hapatia, they will stay with you all game. That library is worth at least three science per turn, which massively boosts you at the beginning of the game. It also gives you more great profit, uh, great scientist points. And you can see now already at this stage of the game, I now have 13 cities. So if I've got a library in every single city, I could be getting up to 13 science per turn. It's a big, big difference. So don't get too tied up in rushing these early game scientists. 
They're not game-breaking, but Hypatia is. The other ones to keep an eye out for are Isaac Newton, that university and library for three, and university is giving you two science per turn. That's also incredibly big. Einstein as well, giving you four science per research lab. Pick up all three of these, and a fully stocked Sayer one is worth at least seven science per turn more. I say at least, because eventually you'll hit rationalism with career, and all of those bonuses will then be at least 50% better because, don't forget, all of your campuses are for adjacency because you've got Seowans. Which leads me on to my second point, Seowan placement. Now, you're still playing Korea, and these scientific districts are still the lifeblood of your empire. They work slightly strangely though. For one, they must be built on hills. For two, they reduce their adjacency for every adjacent district tile. That includes your city centre, so you always want them to be a little bit like Gaul, one tile away from your city centre. And finally, your Three Kingdoms ability means that mines and farms are more powerful when situated around your sale one. So when it comes to placement, you need to make sure you're doing a few things. Firstly, don't put it near any other district. It's really tempting because you're like, oh, well, I can kind of make a pretty good district. Like for instance, this city, I could put one on this desert tile, which is a bit useless and it's plus three. That's still pretty good, right? I know it's not plus four, but it, you know, plus three is still pretty good. No, 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 no. Remember the rationalism card. Do not let any one of your unique campuses fall below four adjacent you will rue the day. 50% of science on a library, university, and research lab combined together at the end of the game is a lot of science to be losing out on. And as soon as you start putting it near other districts, the problem is, is it then becomes very tempting to put other districts near that. Because say, for instance, I did end up putting the Sayer 1 on this tile. Now that's worth plus three. I might be going along, I might capture this city down here, and eventually I might go, oh, well, I'll put an aqueduct there. And suddenly, oh, look, there's an iron and an aqueduct duct and hang on I've now got a really good industrial zone I'll look at that and go yeah that's plus four and then I've forgotten that's now plus two I I've made it worse even better I might then look along in this city and go oh you know what I can now put a plus three commercial hub down there that's also really handy on this desert tile I'm not using well now it's plus one it just hooks you into a bad mentality where your sale ones are just going to get worse and worse and worse and worse so keep them away from everything else. You also want to be very carefully looking at the tiles around them. Now, you get another food for every farm if it's around your Sayer one, and you get another science for every mine. That is three resource. You either use it or you lose it. So for instance, I'm planning on putting a Sayer one on this hill. There are one, two, three, four, five, six tiles around it. However, one of them is a sugar tile. That is a bit of a problem. That will be improved with a plantation. Plantations get no benefit from three kingdoms. So I've kind of lost the benefit of this tile. Up here, for instance, I've got a good example of another plus four. However, that stone would be putting a quarry on. Quarries do not get the science. So in that case, it might be worth removing the stone and putting a regular farm down. I also have a mountain and a lake. Again, I'm not going to get any benefit from those tiles. Gets even worse when you start using tiles like this one. This is a snowy hill. Useless, still worth plus four, but I can't put a single farm around it and there's only one mine that'll go down next to it. So I've kind of lost all of the Three Kingdoms benefit. The other thing to consider is that the effects stack. As you can see, I have a Sayer 1 on this tile, and now I want to put it on this one, which means that the mine between them is now getting two extra science. It's worth keeping an eye on that, because you can start to tessellate. If I were to put a Sayer 1 on this tile, and a Sayer 1 on this tile, for instance, next to already the one that I have over there, and then, because I'm a little further into the game, I have civil engineering, I can now put farms on top of hills. You'll notice that this farm would now be worth plus four. One for the farm itself, and then another one, two, three. That farm would be worth a bonus two food. This one over there would be worth a bonus two food. That one is now potentially worth a bonus two food as well. And what you almost do is end up protecting the land around it. I would put a ring of farms and mines around these sale ones, and I wouldn't want to disturb them. So they become their own little sort of ecosystem system. So you're always balancing. Sticking them one tile apart from each other, so a, a gap in them, can lead to some really fun adjacencies. However, you end up kind of losing some of it. Like for instance, I'm losing a little bit of land next to a CAD, so that's a bit of a problem, and there are some luxuries blocking some of my tiles. But overall, I'm getting a lot of three resource. Keep an eye out in particular for any farmable resources that you can put near Sayer ones. At the beginning of the game, this farm tile was worth a huge amount of food for my capital and let Pingala really shine. I could plonk my Sayer one down and then immediately put a farm down on the resource next to it, giving it a huge chunk of food. That boosted it 
aggregation for me. It helped Pingala to really kick out a lot of bonuses using the Connoisseur and Research promotions. It was very, very handy indeed. Seowans, they are the lifeblood of your empire. Really have a look. If you're playing on PC, remember you can search the map by hill. This will show you all of the valid places on the map that you can put your district. I could even strip out all the tiles with a strategic resource on them, or for instance, a luxury, or for instance, a district. And as you can see, we have now narrowed down all of the places I could think about putting one of my uniques down. Learn to use them and Korea is one of the most powerful science sieves in the game because they're so reliable. And don't forget, early game, focusing on farms is going to be a lot better than focusing on mines. Yes, the mines give you tech, but the farms give you food and more food at that, which means you can level up, you can give yourselves bigger cities with more districts, you can get Pingala working much earlier. Finally, we have to talk about Hangul. When you complete your first technology from a new era, you double your science per turn as culture. If you believe that you are just about to tip over into a new technological era, so for instance, if I were to go into, say, flight or steel, that would be the first tech of the modern era for me. I need to wait until I was approximately two turns away from the end of the era. Now, a lot of Civ YouTubers have kind of touched on this and have shown what you need to do, but effectively, there are two things you need to do. Three things you need to do. Step one, go through every one of your cities and plonk on science focus. This will move your citizens around so that if any tile is working science, like this Alcazar, for instance, or the mines around the Sayer one, they will start to be worked with great priority. It also means if I've got any Sayer ones down with libraries or universities and any of my citizens can move, I will start to work the specialist. You can see I'm now working two specialists within the library, which is generating an additional four science per turn. Now, this may unwittingly starve your empire a little bit, so you might need to just double check that you're not losing too much food. Already, I've seen that my science has jumped from about 133 per turn to 150. That's 17 more science and would be worth another 34 culture when we tip into the new age. A very handy little boost. What you then need to do is any city with, or this is step two I should say, any city with the Sayer one, you then need to make sure that they are working the campus research grant. Now the reason we're doing this two turns before is that the way that campus research grant works is a little bit tricky. What the project does is effectively converts your production into science per turn. Now I've had the apps, you know, the mechanics of it explained to me before. It's basically on a percentage. So I think a certain percentage of a production gets turned into science, but it doesn't calculate it properly until you press end go. And even then, what I've read about the project can differ a little bit. Some people say that if you do it one turn beforehand, that should give your city enough time to convert the production into science and then stick it onto your top line and then convert your culture. Other people say that sometimes the projects can be a little bit fiddly, especially when they finish and you get a little burst of science. Sometimes it's worth letting them run for two turns. Now, I'm pretty sure you could probably get away with running it for just one turn. So waiting until you are one turn away from the new tech before putting all of your projects on. However, I like to be safe and I do it two turns. The other little advantage to that is I can actually, I've got time to then go around my cities with two turns remaining and just move my builders around to make sure that I've done things like finishing all the Sayer ones I can, building all the libraries I can. Look, that was worth another 11 science per turn just doing that. And now I've got the campus research grant that I've got going in this city as well. Just gives you a turn to settle itself out. Other things to consider is if you can do any trading between turns to sort your happiness out. Obviously, I have unhappy cities at the moment and that is suppressing my science by 10% in every city. But did you see that? I just went from about 163 science to 188. By rolling the turn forward, all of the campus research grants are now giving me a bonus to my science based on the production in my cities. It took a turn to work through. So just by making all those changes, I've gone from 133 science to 188. That's almost 50% more science and that's generated me another 120, 130 culture with my Hangul ability. Now in this example, I didn't actually get any more science on the second turn, so I probably could have got away with it on one turn before. But it's something to keep an eye on. Trial and error. Practice what works for you. 
But there you go, that was Ursa's three best tips to maximise each of the three leaders from a fifth instalment of the Leaders Pass. I really hope that something in there was interesting and useful. I really hope you enjoyed the video. If you like this sort of thing, you want to see more guide videos, then why don't you feel free to leave a like on the video? It just helps the traction to grow. And whilst you're at it, consider subscribing. It supports the channel and it's lovely. But until the next video, have a lovely day everybody. See you later. Goodbye! And finally, a very special shout out goes to Glorious Petra, Matthew Wilkinson, Paul Coffey, Doughboy91, Sean Gratiz, Portland, Scott Stratton, Major King Kong, Devil X, Skeptical Bear, Kroger Brand Trail Mix, Alex Noob, Cinnamon Beard, Petra Ryan, Matthew Hatch, Amir EC, Rom88, Radio Torre, Private Selection, Genoa Salami, Boy Zorro, Callum Billy, Garrett Gowan, Polar Bear Ray, L Truand, Creston, RB Hedge, Mushkin Mandeltort, Ezri Dax, Debel Time, Shoelace, Burial, I'm Daft, Guberman, Clint Hennes, Thank you all for your support, it's amazing, see you all next time, goodbye!